Hello, and welcome everybody for the final, the sixth and final session of Moving Towards Generational Healing. Today's title is Remember and Rebuild. Please uh, feel free to submit questions or comments throughout the presentation given by Dr. Ewid Felsen. We encourage you to submit feedback about this series, and we are very, very grateful to have been able to implement these sessions with generous funding from Targum Shlishi Foundation, the MJHS Foundation, and generous family members of Holocaust survivors who, we, who we've cared for. May their memory be a blessing to all. Within approximately one week of today, all of the recordings of the previously held in today's session will be posted on www.mjhs.org slash healing. You will be able to access them in the future. Please share this information with anyone you feel would be interested. Irit? Hi. Um, I'm very grateful to be here again with all of you for our uh, sixth and last session in this series. I do have to mention again, I have no financial disclosures. So I wanted to start by um, mentioning a few points of relevance to what happened before the loss because the experience of loss is very much also influenced in, um, in children of survivors and in other people by the prior experiences that they've had of caretaking of the uh, person that they lost, uh, mostly um, elderly parents were uh, focusing on in this series. So uh, for second generation, for us, for second generation, we know that, uh, as we mentioned in previous sessions, a very sensitive issue um, has to do with separations and loss throughout life. So of course, uh, this is going to be part of the anticipatory anxiety and of the reaction to the loss itself. But there is also a lot of loss that came before the final loss, before, before the final loss of the loved one because they pass away. There are many, many losses that take place over a period of time for both the care recipient the, the person who's ill or uh, aging and ill and the caregiver and our responses to those will be most likely even more accentuated because of our sensitivity to separations and losses. So at the same time, caregivers with all of the difficulty that they are experiencing throughout that process can also experience uh, a tremendous amount of satisfaction and, and gains from the experiences because uh, this is something that's consistent with our understanding of what is post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth has to do with a lot of uh, feelings such as um, a greater clarity about our values, a greater clarity about and coherence about the relationship between our behavior and our values a sense of doing the right thing, a sense of doing the thing that's very meaningful to us, um, a sense of personal growth that comes through the effort that is involved. And while this is not at all related to less suffering, in fact, it is often seen that people who have um, a lot of post-traumatic symptoms are the ones that also have a lot of post-traumatic growth, meaning the suffering itself sort of pushes us to expand and to grow and to, and to uh, extend ourselves. Um, so we may also have the feeling as a result of having done, having lived a richer, uh, fuller, and more meaningful experience or, uh, or life. So a little bit more about uh, 2Gs, about second generation as caregivers to survivor parents. So in general, the support of children and grandchildren is a very critical element for the successful adaptation of elderly people with the challenges of aging. And some of the special characteristics of the survivors and of the second generation might actually be associated with accentuated distress, 
as caregivers to elderly parents and we won't expand too much uh, on this topic because we did talk about it but I'll mention just that since we grew up uh, with unique concerns and accentuated concerns about the well-being of our survivor parents as has been documented widely in the literature uh, we tend to take more upon ourselves as the caregivers to parents more than perhaps peers we have a harder time delegating uh, some of these responsibilities and therefore we have greater distress also af during and after the death of a parent the burden of caregiving is not usually shared uh, really equally among uh, family members it is usually something that falls primarily on one primary caregiver in the family and when there are daughters and sons it often tends to be more the daughter than the son and that might complicate sibling relationships of course and what I also have heard throughout the years and some of the cases were really very very painful and very um, very difficult was the experience of the primary caretaker being torn between the demands of uh, usually her uh, marriage her uh, obligation towards growing up growing children who are usually at the time in high school when the parent was very um, needy and uh, and just these demands of where should I be should I be with the parent should I be with my children should I be with my husband people stopping on their way from work every day at the parents place even if the parent did have an in-home health aid just to make sure that everything is okay and therefore not getting home in time or in a, at a reasonable time when there's still children at home and of course the marriage so a lot of very very difficult uh, tensions and and conflicting demands and sometimes damage to the relationship which remains later on even after the death of the parent and the literature definitely shows that the burden of care is associated especially for that primary caregiver with uh, some detrimental physiological and psychological effects so that also is something that sometimes uh, remains and has to be uh, dealt with what we usually see among the primary caregivers uh, in general is uh, kind of three issues that I identified as filial piety which is the um, obligations that we feel as children as, as sons and daughters of our parents to take care of them and to to do our best for them when they are um, sick or um, aging um, all of the issues around stress and burnout that that role brings with it and oftentimes a lot of guilt the, the, these issues are not unique to second generation but as we can see on the backdrop of some of our unique issues in the relationship and in the dynamics with survivor parents throughout life these issues can be greatly amplified by these long life, uh, lifelong dynamics in Holocaust families so we as I said before are much more reluctant than others in a similar situation to seek assistance to employ uh, other people from outside the family um, if you looked at some of the posts on the second generation Facebook groups before the holidays you could see many people discussing with with obvious distress uh, issues around you know I want to go away for a couple of, of days and uh, my sister doesn't accept anybody else but me staying here because she's also away or all kinds of things like that we have a hard time um, delegating and uh, therefore we are at greater risk for um, stress and for guilt while we care for the parent and the interesting thing is we have guilt when we don't do enough in our opinion and we also have great guilt the more we do because it seems like those who do a lot um, also have this unrelenting feeling that they haven't done enough so it's not only those who feel somehow oh I was away and I wasn't able to do enough it also is often the ones who are there every day doing everything they could still feeling uh, 
they didn't do enough or in fact feeling that it was their job to prevent this or that or do better and they failed at it. All of these things become complicating factors once the parent passes away because we are left with those feelings of shame, of guilt, of having not done enough. However, what I can tell you from actually research into uh, lifelong developments, adult development, is that we do see that there is some indication, some clear indication, empirical indication, that with age comes wisdom. What does that mean? It means that our brains are, um, the brain is a social organ. It keeps changing all the time through its experiences and many, many times uh, through its experiences with its interpersonal environment, so with other people. And therefore, we always continue to have a chance of changing relational patterns that are not so good, changing the ways we see ourselves and we see ourselves in relation to other people. Uh, we can always still change it as we change our ways of interacting with them. And what we also see in, long, in lifelong development studies is that more satisfying relationships and a better network of social support uh, from family, from friends, from colleagues are some of the most important factors in uh, good health and in fact in the uh, longevity of uh, people. So it's really, really important. And when I say uh, with age comes wisdom, what I mean is that Studies show us that we begin to be able to be more capable of uh, reflecting upon our own menta mental processes, upon our own thoughts, the way we look at things. We begin to be able to um, consider multiple truths at the same time, which means looking at the same issue from different perspectives and seeing the validity of all of these perspectives at the same time. All of these things contribute to learning from experience and, and becoming, in a way, wiser, uh, less, uh, thinking less in terms of black and white type of um, categorization. And all of that can really be useful in improving our relationships with spouses, with our older uh, children. Um, we can also become much more attuned to people, whether it's our spouses, older children, or our grandchildren, than perhaps we were at earlier ages. And we can help them benefit from the um, increased level of our um, wisdom and relational maturity, even at this point in life. So uh, again, to stress a point that is very, very important to me in terms of what is resilience, and uh, I, I want us to be very aware of the fact that resilience and moving on is not the absence of pain, the absence of even some symptoms of anxiety or depressive symptoms. It is actually the capacity to move on despite adversity and despite some of these symptoms, just as much as courage is not the absence of fear, but the capacity to move on despite feeling the fear, so feeling the fear and moving on anyway. So survivors as a group definitely represent an amazing group of people that were able to uh, reestablish themselves in, um, in a world that was completely new and different from them with uh, different skill sets. Some of them had better ones, some of them had less good ones but they all, as a group, managed to recreate lives with very little help, most of them, from the environment, and to function fairly well in society, some of them extremely well, despite catastrophic losses and pain. And we, their children, have to remember that in many, many ways, we also inherited many of these resiliencies. So what would I like us to sort of remember as particularly important points that help us enhance well-being and healing? First of all, I think we have to really educate ourselves about post-traumatic stress symptoms and post-traumatic stress disorder and understand 
a lot of the behaviors that were so problematic and had such a bad impact on the relationship between survivors and their children understand it in the context of not, oh, what a difficult person my parent was, or they didn't love me enough, or um, they didn't value me enough, but really understand it as the post-traumatic impact on the parent and therefore on the relationship, but not exactly who the parent was as a person or how they felt about you necessarily. We also have to understand the interaction between these things, which we are somewhat more susceptible to, namely post-traumatic uh, symptoms, and how they interact with our grief because they tend to complicate our grief responses. And so we have to take a step back and understand that when we suffer from very intense or complicated thoughts and feelings about the loss of a parent, that we need to look at it a little bit uh, as part of the response, uh, the way it interacts with, with our post-traumatic um, responses and symptoms and not to be completely in it as if that is the only way to experience the loss. We have to try to uh, be aware of the distinction between past and present. We have to understand that certain things that we learned were contextual, they were appropriate or at least understandable in a certain environment in the way things were in our childhood, in our home childhood uh, environment, but that the here and now is different, that the people that we live with now and interact with now are different and allow for different patterns of uh, relationships. We have to correct some of the, this is perhaps for me the most important point and uh, it's so important to me that I put it, uh, some of you might have noticed, in a, in my, on my blog last, uh, last night. We have to correct some of our perceived conflicting messages. When parents, um, when parents communicated because of their anxiety, because of their depressive uh, experiences, because of their fear for our safety, all kinds of messages uh, don't go, don't go, don't do, uh, messages that sort of uh, in, prevented some of their children from going away to college when they really wanted it, or taking that job far away, or expanding in many different ways in their own lives and feeling entitled to doing that. Many children took it as a real statement by the parents somehow about the fact that or, or, or resent the parents for the fact that they uh, impacted their lives in ways that detracted from the child's happiness and ability to pursue their own needs. And I think while that is one truth, because that sometimes was the impact, what we can do now is still sort of focus on the main essential question, do you believe that your parent wanted you to be happy? If they were not impacted by their PTSD and by their losses and by their anxieties and by them being immigrants in a different and new environment, which not all of them were able to navigate as well, would they have wanted to support you? Would they have wanted you to be happy? And if you recognize that in the essence of it, our parents wanted us to be happy, that was really their raison d'etre in a way, their reason for staying, staying alive and continuing to uh, live and to rebuild. If we understand that, we can now give ourselves permission to move on and to be happy. We have to selectively attend and se selectively remember certain things. And of course, because of the negativity bias that we all are susceptible to, we tend to remember the times when parents said, don't go, don't do. Um, I have a very good example, which I refer to usually as my um, roast therapy. I had a patient whose father in his 80s was doing all the cleaning and all the cooking in his house, which was falling apart because he couldn't take care of it very well anymore. His wife was very depressed, although she was not the one who was a survivor, and his um, daughter and her daughter had moved into that very little house because the daughter divorced and uh, was very disordered. 
and my patient who was uh, another daughter in the family and who was married and living uh, in her own home kept telling me how um, how impactful her father's don't drive if it's raining a little bit don't drive if it's a hot day stay home don't do this don't do that how much of an impact it had on her and at one time before the holiday when she was telling me how her father does all the cooking and he can barely see anymore and it's so hard for him and I said what would happen if you brought the roast to your father and she was like but he says he doesn't want it he doesn't want it he doesn't he want and I said and what will happen if you will come with the ready roast will he throw it away or will you be able to show him that you can and that it's okay despite his message so and I also remember in her in that particular case uh, having the possibility of pointing out to her that at one point when she did do something very successful and was uh, there was a picture of hers in the newspaper about it how proudly her father showed it to all of the people in the neighborhood so to focus on those moments when the parent was able to be very proud of us because we did manage to actually do what we thought was good for us and not to think that um, their fears and anxieties which they uh, could not control were the real message that they meant to communicate so we have to give ourselves permission at this point to recognize that we are loyal to our parents while we can also move on and be happy that it is our responsibility right now as adults to find how and uh, what makes us happy how to be happy how to move on and do that in our lives and that they might have communicated confusing messages the parents but they certainly would have wanted us to be happy and there is a beautiful movie out right now called this is life I believe where a mother who's dying of cancer gives this message very very beautifully to her son and um, I would recommend that uh, I'll mention it a little bit later on so what are some of the takeaways from our meetings in the last several uh, weeks uh, first of all I have a suggestion I think and I try to communicate it throughout that one of the ways in which we can help ourselves uh, heal is using uh, writing as a therapeutic tool and so I suggest that you write a letter to your younger self as if you were the parent that you would have wished to have and tell that child that you were as the parent that you wish you would have had all the beautiful things that they are and that you see in them all the things that you are proud of them how much you're proud of them all the things that they will do and that they will accomplish that will bring you so much joy what kind of good people they will become and how much you will be uh, pleased to see that and um, tell them that you allow them to do it in their own way and that if they manage to live well and to be happy that will be your way of living on in them and continuing and that they need to be doing that they need to be happy in their own way for both of you some of the takeaways uh, that I thought I would put down here for us to look at um, the tasks of morning which we started with please look at the first session and identify for yourself the different ways in which the different tasks or phases based on the two different models um, how you experience them be able to uh, to be aware of of the fact when when this kind of a phase or that kind of a phase comes over you and accept your personal journey through them at your own pace they are not a linear series of phases this one comes that one comes this one comes back again just accept the journey through them and be confident that the journey will lead you to a better place at your own pace as we mentioned we have a special uh, familiarity with death but not with natural death so try to recognize and to identify in your own reactions those catastrophizing reactions the 
disproportionate and irrational guilt and all kinds of other extremely negative reactions to the loss which are really strongly colored by the past, strongly colored by our uh, family dynamics, strongly colored by the legacy of catastrophic loss and recognize that there is a certain difference between this loss uh, due to, to the natural cycle of life and these reactions which are sort of implanted in us because of the because of the presence of catastrophic genocidal death in the family atmosphere. Uh, be accepting of whatever your responses are because we're all different. We had all very different relationships with our survivor parents. Our survivor parents had very different levels of uh, post-traumatic symptoms. Some were very damaged, some were very minimally uh, damaged in terms of how much it impacted their relational competence. And so, you know, we all had very, very different family atmospheres, family life, and relationships with them. That, of course, means we all have very different experiences and be cognizant of this, the wide range of personal experiences amongst us children of survivors and accept that yours and everybody else's are valid with all of these differences. Find other people that you can actually really talk with about the most negative feelings that you have because keeping it in and trying to just suppress it, deny it, not think about it is actually not going to be um, good for your physical or for your psychological well-being. I and Thou, I mentioned the booklet by Martin Buber and this very important concept of his of really sanctifying the otherness of the other person, recognizing that other people are different and that when they have opinions and choices that are different from our own, it is not a personal assault on us, that we can talk about it and we can respect it and we can, as the saying goes, uh, agree to disagree while remaining in connection. It is not uh, that we can either uh, convince the other person or be convinced by them or we cannot, we cannot have a relationship. When we are hurt or offended by someone, ask yourself, what are you attributing actually to that person's behavior? And is there another possible explanation for their behavior? Or are you responding from your own wound, from a place of an automatic response that is not really the only way to respond, but it is your automatic response from a long time ago. Try to show greater tolerance to interpersonal differences than perhaps was modeled in your childhood home. You are older now, you have the wisdom or, that comes with age, try to use it in that way. Try to negotiate conflicting needs and accept compromises. Sometimes it's very, very important to learn to accept some kinds of, uh, of acceptable solutions that are not exactly what either side would have wished for, but is an acceptable compromise. And most importantly, in order to do that, we have to learn to use active listening, which we tried to talk a little bit about. Listen in, in truth to what it is that the other person is trying to say, not just in order to give them their turn in the conversation so that you can say what you have to say, but really in order to hear what it is that they're trying to say. And then when you do want to say what you have to say, say it in such a way that they will be able to really take it in and hear it. As I always say to my students and to other people when I speak about this topic, say things in a way that they'll go into the ear without hurting, without hurting, and then they go in and one can hear you. Trauma in the family emphasizes our negativity bias, which we talk about, which we talked about, the, ten, the, the sensitivity and the tendency to be very alert to what is a potential threat or danger in the environment, the physical environment, the the environment of interpersonal relationships, the social, political environment. However, 
we do need to also learn to sometimes turn off that alarm system and just relax and enjoy ourselves and be in the moment. It is a very important capacity in order to be able to enjoy uh, good moments with other people and allow them to see that we enjoy our time with them and that we enjoy them. So uh, while we have a great capacity to do a lot of things for our loved ones, we have to improve the quality of how it feels to just be with them and be and for them to be with us. Pay attention to positive experiences. We are sometimes, because of the negativity bias, not so good at allowing ourselves to really slow down and notice the positive, notice the beautiful moment. So actually intentionally work on allowing yourself to prolong positive experience experiences, notice them, prolong them, expand them. And in order to do that, it's very important to identify what are the ways in which we avoid or curtail such positive experiences? What thoughts or things jump into my ma our minds as something that we have to do now or a way to sort of get away from the positive moment? And when you pay attention to these thoughts that interrupt the positive moments, like, oh, but I have to do the dishes. Oh, but I have to get back to this email or that email. Say to yourself, do I really have to or can it wait? I'll get back to it later. Let me enjoy this particularly beautiful moment when I'm, I don't know what, having a cup of tea with my daughter because later on she won't be available or whatever uh, the moment might be. Practice self-compassion is a very, very important issue for us. We are not so great in, in this uh, arena, you know, for people who have been trained from an early age to be aware of other people's needs and put other people's needs ahead. It's hard to be sometimes um, uh, compassionate towards oneself. Uh, remind yourself to be very kind to yourself, at least as kind as you would be to someone that you love. We are all imperfect. We all make mistakes. It's part of being alive. Part of the cost of, this, of, the, of, the, uh, of doing business is what people say about, you know, making mistakes and having to uh, absorb some losses in, in the business world, right? So part of being alive is making mistakes. Uh, it's very important to acknowledge the self-critical voice inside, but we have to learn to reframe it in a kinder, friendlier way because as one of my own studies showed, one of my earlier studies, we children of survivors tend to have a very highly critical um, perception of ourselves, a very high sense of self-criticism that we need to tame a bit and make a little bit less harsh. We do need to acknowledge our Achilles heel when we have in, in interpersonal relationships. We need to acknowledge what we did wrong when it acts up. We need to own it and we need to apologize as soon as possible after an impasse with other that is not par contradictory to what I said before. In fact, the more compassionate we are towards ourselves, the easier it is to also apologize when we do do uh, something wrong or find ourselves having acted from that wound or that Achilles heel. Self-compassion is actually like inner support. It's like an inner support that allows us to be actually stronger, more compassionate toward ourselves, more compassionate towards others. It's that which allows us actually, after we did something wrong, to pick up and try again. Try to become mindful of your own style of adaptation. I think it would be a good idea to perhaps go over the list of the strengths and vulnerabilities uh, that I identified as um, particular issues for the second generation in session four try to think which of them characterize you more than others and own both the downside and the upside of these particular characteristics. Recognize that you continue to influence the people around you, even your very adult grown-up children, certainly your spouse, certainly your siblings, your friends, and your grandchildren uh, still at any time 
in our relationship with them. We continue to be influential. We continue to have an impact, whether it's through moments of uh, this control of anger or of uh, upset or of anxiety, or whether it is through detachment and withdrawal and what is perceived as lack of uh, interest or emotional availability. So whichever are the ways that you can identify are more, more uh, typical of your adaptational style, of your uh, relational style, whichever the downside is that you can identify as your own, try to lean in um, and, and go against it. Be open to input from the people around you and use it in a, in a constructive, corrective way. Go against those tendencies. Uh, here is a beautiful uh, video from uh, Beatrice Beebe about interactions between infants and, uh, and, and their mothers. And I know that most of us are no longer parents of infants, but some of us are grandparents already. And in any case, what it shows is the uh, unbelievable importance of being attuned to the very, very uh, sensitive way in which we impact each other, even infants, the way that they respond to very minute micro interactions in the relationship. So I thought it would be worthwhile watching. So let's look at that for a minute. We're trying to understand the baby's nonverbal language. And it has many components. Emotion, which could either be facial expression, facial emotion, or vocal motion. We also study orientation. Perhaps the most central one is attention, and certainly is where you start when you're looking and playing with the baby, is the baby attending. So um, the reason I included that uh, is actually because if we're aware of these issues and we can and we can make our children perhaps who are now parenting their own children aware of these issues and if we can interact differently even with adults around us and certainly with our grandchildren then we are going against some of these automatic patterns of uh, not being able to be very attuned, not being able to be very sensitive to the uh, emotional cues in a relationship because um, for us as children of survivors, um, studies show that our perception was that our parents were not very well emotionally attuned to us and some of the studies show that our parenting had some uh, shared characteristics with the parenting that we received, which is, of course, something that makes sense. But going against that, becoming more aware of these issues and more sensitive to it is uh, a way to stop uh, the impact from continuing. There is also a beautiful uh, still face experiment that really shows the responsivity of the infant to, to facial um, um, cues from the parent, which I think I included in the resources for one of the previous um, sessions. So uh, that can be also watched and it's very informative with Edward Tronic, still face experiment. You can also just look for it on Google in, in the, on the internet. Allowing yourself to acknowledge your pain is not wallowing in it as we tend to think sometimes because we were trained to not exactly allow ourselves to look at what we were feeling. Um, it's not a weakness. It's actually associated with less physical and psychological distress. So as I said before, it's important to acknowledge it within ourselves and it's even important to find someone 
with whom we can openly discuss it. And it's very important for us to also be aware and know what methods of self-care are helpful to us. What are we maybe already doing when we're actually in a good place, but we tend to forget these things when we suffer. So is it painting? Is it writing? Is it running? Is it um, exercising? Is it meditating? Is it praying? What is it that makes you feel better, that supports you from within and replenishes your vitality and your and energizing energizes you? You might be already using many of these things, but you might forget to use them, especially when you need them most. So become very aware of them so that you can actually turn to them when you most need it. And again, I cannot emphasize it enough how important it is at this point in life to tend our relationships our relationships all of them and in particular um, at the at midlife and in the later years to turn our attention to our couple or partner relationship if we have one in particular and to repair and enhance intimacy in that relationship is a very very important part of um, Vi st staying vital and healthier and feeling more uh, well-being at, at this part of life. People do better also when they are very aware of their signature strengths and their particular talents and when they find opportunities to use them as often as possible and especially in the service of something that is meaningful to them. That can be uh, you know, doing art with our grandchildren that can be teaching something using art to somebody else. Uh, if I'm looking at art as the one particular talent that perhaps somebody has, it can be something new that we learn to do. I had a patient who never thought she could paint and she started taking um, painting classes at the JCC near her home and she became an incredibly uh, capable uh, painter at uh, in mid at, in her mid sixties. So don't be afraid to try out new ways of expression, and uh, certainly try to identify your own talents, whatever they are, and use them as often as possible. There are several ways in which we can do that. We can find expression and meaningful connections to the deceased, to the person that we lost. And um, we can find many ways to commemorate the person that we lost, our connection with them, which can be private ways of doing it or ways that are shared with others in a way that connects to some uh, purpose that we feel is very important to us. And I wanted to give you some examples. One of them, as you see in the bottom of the slide, is um, uh, uh, Michael Rubel's, uh, a colleague of mine, um, he, the way he chose to commemorate his father was by creating a program for schools that takes a school bus, provides a school bus for uh, school classes and takes them for a day trip to the Museum of the Holocaust in D.C. There's always a survivor or two on the bus and Michael Rubel himself and uh, the children from various non-Jewish uh, schools go and really learn about the Holocaust and its meaning and discuss it and, and, and are really educated about um, many issues uh, around it, the Holocaust and issues uh, related to bigotry and discrimination and the dangers of all of this. That was his way and it's called the uh, Michael Rubel Holocaust Remembran Remembrance Journeys. I also want to show you the very remarkable um, work of Rose Jacobs, uh, um, uh, a friend and a colleague who created her, she's a painter, and she created the documentary Finding Kalman, Kalman being the young brother of her mother who was lost in the Holocaust. When I was a kid, I always thought that I would be able to find Kalman somehow. Carmen was about three years younger than me, very good boy, although he always wanted to prove to the teacher that she's not right and he's right. I want to remember and I want to have a, a 
a good time too. One thing doesn't go without the other. Pain goes together with happiness. Although we lived in the United States, we didn't have friends, American friends. For some reason, we clicked better. We understood each other. We understood each other's pain. I grew up in this community of survivors that was a, just, a, a, I think, everyone lost so many people that we all became each other's family. There's a way to bring light even into the darkest situations. And that's, that's what painting does for me and that's what hearing those stories of the past offered me as well, bringing light into the darkness. So um, bringing light into the darkness and being able to live and experience pain and happiness is really what we're trying to we're trying to do. And indeed, the immigration of the survivors of the Holocaust to America, to Israel, to other places was an incredible. Uh, success story on the whole. In this, in this country, as William Helmreich quoted in his book, uh, Against All Odds, by 1953, which is really a mere handful of years after the end of the war in Europe, less than 2% of the Jews who arrived in this country required financial assistance. So, uh, there is no question that as a group, most of the survivors and most of their children have shown remarkable resilience and remarkable good adaptation in many, many areas of life alongside an invisible um, pain that we carry inside. I want to uh, end by uh, sharing with you a quote that I think is a, a beautiful quote by Stephen Huller. A pearl is a beautiful thing that is produced by an injured life. It is the pear from the injury of the oyster. The treasure of our being in this world is also produced by an injured life. If we had not been wounded, if we had not been injured, then we would not have produced the pearl. I want to thank you all for being with us. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you all. I wish you a very, very happy, healthy 2019. And I really welcome your feedback and your comments about anything and everything related to your expectations from this webinar and your experiences. Um, while participating in it, and I will be very appreciative. I will be very appreciative of uh, anyone who chooses to share those thoughts with us. Happy, healthy 2019, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Irit. That was amazing as always. And we have to thank you for the generosity of spirit, your wisdom, your experience in touching everyone who participated in these uh, sessions. Uh, it, I couldn't help but think about the saying that has such tremendous meaning in Hebrew, Maseh Avot Siman Labanim. The actions of our fathers are a symbol uh, and uh, give meaning for the children. And one of the things that you uh, spoke about uh, really in depth was about reflecting um, to look at the multiple truths at the same time and help us become wiser. Right. And right. I wonder, I wonder uh, if you might be able to speak to um, this question, can past disruptive patterns of behavior both in family dynamics between the survivor parent and the second generation child, can they be changed and remedied and reconciled so that it is not repeated in the second generation with the third generation child? 
And as we, that's the question I wanted to ask you, but as we went through the sessions, different comments and questions came up. And one in particular, I think, speaks to this very same thing and is very powerful. And um, it's, here, here it is. How do I implement all these things, like forgiving myself, if my child is now in therapy and has decided her upbringing was, in retrospect, terrible because of me, her mother. Can you speak to that? Well, you know, this is part of what we have been really speaking to. This is a very poignant case, a very poignantly put uh, experience of this particular person, yes? This is what we're talking about. Sometimes we can't help the fact that at some point we acted in certain ways that were uh, what we had at the time and it may have had some damage, but we can always try. We can't undo the past. We all know that. All we can do is have a very different relationship in the present with that person, which has to start by owning, acknowledging certain things, um, and really trying to have a different relationship in the here and now. And by the way, I have a patient who's, uh, who could be uh, saying the same thing as this comment, except um, her daughter is very, very adamantly focused on the damage in a way that it's been years now that my patient has been doing very differently, has been really trying to show that she's in a very different place in life at this point and, and able and willing to do very differently. And it's very hard for the daughter to come to that place, which is understandable as well. But what I mean to say by that, when we own what we did in the past, when we own our mistakes, when we own and acknowledge the pain that it might have caused, and when we try to do different now in the present, it doesn't mean that we have to fall into now an opposite uh, relationship with the child where now there is some kind of a, a continuous beating up of the second generation parent as a, as a way to somehow make things better. We don't make things better by changing the direction of the uh, abuse, so to speak. We have to change it by actually doing something different, which means be someone who offers and also tries to model um, respect for both sides, hearing and owning both the, the feelings on both sides, but not accepting abuse in any of the directions of the relationship, not from the second generation to the third, not from the third back to the second, but really saying, I acknowledge, I own, how can I make it better, and I'm trying to do what you need from me now in the best possible way. Thank you. That's, that's a very good lesson, I think. Uh, I hope that answers uh, your question, uh, the person that posted it. Um, I want to ask something that's the flip side of the same coin, perhaps a little bit uh, overlapping, but also I think a little bit different, which is uh, many second generation Holocaust survivors, because of the sometimes uh, tough love uh, shared or, or given by parents, uh, there are those members of the second generation who grew up being um, uh, given uh, criticism, criticized for whatever they did, whether good or bad, successful but not successful enough. Um, and, and sometimes, I, I've witnessed it, uh, the adult second generation child, <clears throat> excuse me, will sometimes take um, the abuse, if you will, whether from the parent or from the child or, or from the third generation with the feeling of uh, it's coming to me, my gilly, you know, uh, you know, this is what my parents said and, and look now my child is saying the same thing. How do you break that? How, how does one break that? Where, 
you, you spoke a great deal about healing self-compassion as a vehicle to healing. Can you give a little bit of information in that direction, how to help break that pattern of feeling that you deserve the negative criticism that you see from others? Well, you know, I think it's directly related to that internalized, very harsh self-criticism that I saw in one of my early studies. And in, my, in that early study, I saw exactly what you said. I mean, I checked the perception of the second generation of each of their parents, the, of, of the actual, the way we thought our actual mother was, our actual father was, um, what would be uh, the way we saw our actual self and the way we saw our ideal self, how we would like to be. And what the findings showed very clearly was that second generation perceived their mother in particular as very critical and that they in actuality identified with that highly uh, critical um, mother that they perceived. So they were very self-critical, but they wished in their ideal self to be a lot less self-critical. So this is exactly what you're saying, an internalized sense of criticism. And I think part of it is really uh, a lot of work on self-compassion, a lot of work on I am enough. I am enough, this was my path, this is my path, and really focusing on the good and that which was accomplished and on being enough and on the things that we are that actually mean a lot to us, that are very important to us, that we did do and that we are, and not always on that somehow differential between what we are and what we somehow ought to be or are expected to be, to really sort of work on the sense of we are enough. I think I com included in the slides, if I go back for a minute, uh, no, it's in the, um, I think that in the, in, in no, I will, um, the, the, there are some very, uh, interesting um, TED Talks and uh, other things which I will try to send. There was a very cute, not cute, cute, but also very uh, poignant thing that came up on one of the face group, uh, Facebook groups, uh, some performer um, talking about I am enough. And that is a very important thing. We are enough. We are in midlife or older. What we have become and what we have done is almost complete in the sense that we're not going to become the president of this country if we haven't become it yet. And we have to just change the way we look at it and look for the good, look for the positive, look for what we have accomplished, look for that which I was asking you to do when writing that letter to your younger self. Be that very enhancing accepting, loving, supportive parent that looks at this child and says to that child, all the good things that I do see in you, and then all the good things that we have become, tell that child how wonderful that is, how, look at it this way, and really tell yourself and tell that child inside and the adult that you have become how good those things are, but take the time to really do a good job of it. We are enough. We are enough. Thank you. Excellent. Very, very, very helpful information. I want to thank you again. I want to encourage uh, all people participating today and anyone who signs in uh, to the recording in the future to please submit any questions you have, comments, feedback. It's relevant to us. It's relevant to those in the future who will be turning to professionals for help. Thank you, and have a happy and healthy New Year all. Thank you.